Honor, celebrate, inspire. Three words that we can start with today, thanks to the NHL and the NHL Players Association during Black History Month. And it is my honor to welcome former NHL netminder turned elite NHL analyst, Kevin Weeks. Weeksy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Duffer. Thanks so much for doing this, man. You uh, glad to see your smiling face. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much for helping me along as much as you did in the early days, man, to help in that very transition you just talked about. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I look back at that time and uh, it's in some ways hard to believe how long ago it was, but the beauty true. is like you've been as fresh and true from that first moment to now. So it almost feels like just this wonderful continuation. Uh, thank um, you. <laughs> we have an ECHL affiliate in Buffalo with Cincinnati Cyclones and their former play-by-play -play announcer is the first broadcaster for the NHL's newest team, the Seattle Kraken, Everett Fitzhugh. Everett, great to have you with us today. Hey, thank you very much for having me. And it's a pleasure to join uh, you, Kevin, and, and Ryan for this discussion. Yeah, and obviously one of the most diverse, well-rounded, well-traveled, well-respected beat writers in the NHL is now Seattle-based as well for The Athletic in Ryan Clark. Ryan, it's our pleasure to have you. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. It's cool to be in the room with someone like Kevin Weeks and then with Everett. It's like, yeah, him and I talk every week. So like, yeah, whatever. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank think you that's, guys. you know, that's the, in a way, it's kind of the beauty of the game is no matter how far apart we may be geographically, I think a lot of us are at ease with each other because we're all in it at the same level, so to speak, as we talk about the game. And as the saying goes here for this month, we celebrate those within the game. And this being Black History Month, I just, I really wanted to start with, what does Black History Month mean to you? Ryan, we'll start with you. Here's what it means to me. It's just kind of a reminder of the past, the present, and in a lot of ways, the future. I mean, we, we talk about Black History in the sense of hey, here are things that different inventors have done. Um, George Washington Carver, uh, Garrett Morgan being another one. But then I think it's also a look at, well, what have we really learned from Black history? And I think when we look back at this past spring and summer with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Jacob Blake, it's a reminder that for as much as we talk about these things, in a lot of cases, we don't always talk about these things. And like anything, history is cyclical. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's bang on. And, and I would even go a step further as to say it's an opportunity for us as as black people to learn our history, more about our history. But I think the widespread, the mainstream to to learn more than than what we're taught in school. I remember when I was growing up in school, it was Harriet Tubman. It was Dr. King. You might be lucky if you get Frederick Douglass in there, um, but there were a lot of very important, influential, you know, black figures that I was taught about at home. My mom would take me to the museum. My mom would do a lot of things at home to teach me. So I think this is crucial in, in educating everyone about, no, there's more to black history than just slavery and the civil rights movement. And, and, and I love the phrase of, Black history is American history. And I would love for, for one of these days, we're learning about all aspects of black history the same way you know we learn about President's Day. We learn about Neil Armstrong. We learn about other mainstream uh, uh, things that happen in history. Black history should be right alongside that, taught every day in schools and not just confined to that box of February. Yeah, well said, guys. I mean, I think, you know, it all starts with educating. And from an educational standpoint, it educates people that look like us and those that don't at the same time, which I think is really important for all the, all the reasons you guys mentioned. I think that's really critical, having a good sense of understanding and, and bettering one's understanding as to the kind of historical context, the different people that have come before us that have had major marks and major impacts in different ways across the board, uh, be it via civil rights, be it via excellence, uh, be it via innovation. I mean, there's so many different things, uh, struggles, mistreatment, everything all, all boiled into one. So I like the, the educational and enlightening part of it. I also think that it's important for uh, context because I feel like a lot of times the, the fabric in the context of the, of the fabric of the history, not only of the country, but also the world where we're concerned is, is often uh, misleading or inaccurate. So I think that that context is important. And then I also feel too, it's to, to continue to inspire and empower. You know, that's really important to inspire people that look like us, 
to inspire people that don't look like us. So I feel it is a, a very 360 thing in terms of just highlighting it. And as you guys said, it's not limited to this month, but it's great to see the spotlight shining on it in this month. It is an everyday thing. It's been a historical thing, but I think it also light, lights or illuminates a path to the future as well. Yeah. Well, since you guys said it, I'll hold it up right now. You can <laughs> clearly see. Um, yeah. and, th and this is from Idris Wajid, uh, you know, and if yeah. you've seen the video this month of his design of the Sabres logo for Black History Month and for a local organization, Breaking Barriers. And, and Idris is an incredible artist. And this is just one of the offerings that, that he has out there right now. And it, it is really important. And, and I love the way each of you phrased it. And yet at the same time, when I was approaching this question, I was also curious um, whether Black History Month causes any discomfort among people that you know. Yeah, I think it does for some people. For some people, it, it makes them uncomfortable. Um, and, and I would say more over people that don't look like us, per se, or maybe not on the same part of the color wheel. I think that it, it does bring up about some discomfort, unfortunately, for some people and some of those people. And I feel like it's sometimes it's a sense of insecurity. Sometimes it's a sense of not really knowing or some trepidation or it just being very different because it's not something that's done with regularity. So it it's, can be kind of foreign to people and kind of shocking. Like, what do you mean this, this month? Like, why is that happening? Why this month? I don't understand. Like, and it can take people aback at times, but I love the point that uh, that Everett made in that black history is American history and black history is a part of world history as well. It transcends our country and, and back in Canada, for example, and, and the world over. So that's something that I think with time and then some exposure, I feel that there are people that I do know that have become, I mean, infinitely more comfortable and that's great to see. And I think for other people that aren't as comfortable, always take stock and ask yourself why. Just stop and take a pause and ask yourself why. Is there something that may have happened to you? Did you have a, a, a bad experience? Did a sibling or somebody have a bad experience? And, and try to be introspective and, and see what that source of your why is. I've heard both sides of that argument too, Kevin, in, in that from, you know, from, from the non-black side of, well, there's no white history month. Why is there a black history month? Why, you know, you've heard that. But then also I've heard black folks say, how dare you try and just, make our history fit into one month. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know plenty of, of white people, of, of non-black non people, and I know plenty of black people who are upset at the idea of a Black History Month for a multitude of reasons. I mean, it, for me personally, I feel like it's something that if, if you don't talk about things, those things get lost in history. And, and, and especially the last few years. You've been hearing a ton of people saying, you know, move on. It was our history. It happened. Let it go. Forget it about so many other things. But if you let things go, that's how we forget. So I think being able to talk about these things, talking about what makes us as black people, what makes us as a society, what makes us as just human beings. And I know it sounds cliche, but what makes us different is what makes us great. And I've never understood the trepidation of people wanting to celebrate differences and, and wanting to celebrate the, the impact that different cultures, different genders, different religions, just different people have made. So I, I totally understand that point of why do we have to celebrate Black History Month? You know, we should just move on and, and whatever. But on the other side of that, you can't put Black history into this 28, sometimes 29 day box. Well, you know, that point, Everett, I think it goes back to a larger conversation when you talk about differences, because there are people who say, for example, we're all Americans, we're all Canadians. And it's like, yes, that's true, but understand it for a segment of people in both those nations, like their culture, their history, what matters to them, or hasn't been viewed in the mainstream in the most positive light. When you look at Black history, for example, like there was a high school course I took that was a history course, and then a separate one that was a Black history course. And in that course, like we learn about people like, like Nat Turner, which like the story of Nat Turner, I mean, to put it PC, like it is a very, very, very graphic one, but it's also one where you sit there and ask yourself, if we can hear about Shays Rebellion and we can hear about all these stories in the American Revolution, 
mm-hmm. that talk about people fighting for something that they believe in, then when you look at things like Nat Turner, when you look at people like Frederick Douglass, when you look at that whole movement, violent or nonviolent, it's a part of American history. Mm-hmm. And it just, when people feel like that's not discussed, it's like, how can you have this true American or Canadian experience when you only want to pick and choose things that sound right and sound digestible as opposed to the honest truth? There, there needs to be that understanding of, of representation of stories day in, day out, that it can't just be so one-sided. And, and as you know, the oft-used phrase when it comes to making progress is you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I don't know, should we just keep it to hockey on this one? Are we, are we making progress in that regard as, as to those words, Ryan? I think in terms of hockey, the answer is I, it's hard to say. Because on one hand, like you see people have opinions about things related to race, xenophobia, and it's a discussion that hasn't been had uh, really ever. And so, yes, you're seeing progress on that front, but at the same time, like there also has to be the understanding that you just waded into this discussion. So you have to approach it as you're still learning, you're still knowing, you're still understanding. Like you don't have all the answers. And I think as it relates to hockey, and then I'm curious to hear what Kevin and Everett have to say, like baseball and Jackie Robinson had this moment and it's been an ongoing conversation, whether it's with players integrating managers front office, uh, Kurt Flood being the first free agent, and for him as a black man, what that meant. With the NFL, we are constantly seeing examples of how people feel that league gets it right, gets it wrong, or some days just it's somewhere in the middle. And with the NBA, like we saw that that's a league that anytime something goes on with race, it's understood that they're kind of the standard. And even then in that league, there are things that they admit are problematic. Whereas with the NHL, it's like by comparison, and the best way to, I think, describe it is, if everybody else is doing advanced trigonometry and you're hockey in the NHL, like you understand that there's numbers, plus signs and minus signs, but you can't expect someone who's just learning this to basically go out and do the sort of rocket science that you would expect from someone at SpaceX who's been studying this their whole life. Yeah, I, I think the fact that these conversations, you know, are, are happening is a good thing. Um, and I'll preface that by saying, obviously, it's it's not enough. And I don't think until we get to a place where um, we're, we're fully embracing our collective diversity within the sport, it's never going to be enough. But but I think the fact that you're starting to have these conversations, better late than never, right? But it's it's a shame that it took the death of George Floyd to really get this kind of this train moving a little bit. And I feel with, with everything that happened this summer with the HDA and players kneeling in the bubble and, and bringing attention to these issues, um, it, it's making people, Duffer, like you said, uncomfortable. I, I love that phrase. I've been a huge fan and a believer of that phrase. It, it's, it, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. But I think where people kind of, you lose a lot of people is we just in our nature, we hate being uncomfortable. We don't like being uncomfortable. We want to feel safe and secure and wrapped up and, 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 you know, nice and cozy. It's okay to, to not be okay. It's okay to feel uncomfortable because when you start having these conversations, when you start talking to people who have lived experiences that you might not have, you get a better understanding of what they're going through. And, you know, Kevin was talking earlier about representation and about, you know, uh, seeing people who don't look like you. That's how I got into the game of hockey. That's how I got into the sport. And I tell folks that story of the late 90s, early 2000 Edmonton Oilers without Anson Carter, Mike Greer, and George The Rock, I'm not sitting here today. Without Jerome McGinley and Kevin Weeks, I'm not sitting here today. And people don't want to have that conversation because it's, oh, well, they were just good hockey players. Who cares if they were black or not? Well, I cared. As a 12-year-old black kid growing up in Detroit who was always told, man, you're six foot three. You don't play basketball. You don't play going to a barber shop and, and, and telling my barbers and everyone in there that I'm a hockey fan and, and getting the side looks. It mattered to me, but people don't want to have that conversation. So being un- being comfortable with being uncomfortable is massive, and you have to be able and willing to have these conversations in order to move forward. Great points. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. There's so much there, so much meat on the bone there from all of you. I think 
you know, from a personal kind of experience in it all, I've been uncomfortable since 1982 or 83. I played AAA hockey as an underage in Toronto from like, which is now novice, like from then through the whole cycle to present day, mm. it's been, and fortunately, at least our teams in minor hockey back home were always very diverse and Toronto is very diverse in a lot of ways. So at least our teams then in the early eighties through until when I got to junior, they represented the various different backgrounds that we have. So whether we had, you know, Irish teammates, Filipino, East Indian, Russian, Mexican, Greek, Portuguese, Caribbean, British, Italian, you name it, and, and white Canadian. So it was really cool that way. But at the same time, and, and Duffer, you, you could probably understand this based on geographically where you are. I felt like I was walking on a high wire, like a tightrope over Niagara Falls the whole time, literally from when I was eight to at times present day at 45. But certainly during my playing career and even in my broadcasting career, I, I felt that way for sure. So I embraced that because I knew at you know, six years old, and Miss Mahar's class in grade one, as we say in Canada, grade, you know, first grade, as we say here, I was going to play in the NHL. And I drew the NHL logo, the scoreboard, me as a goalie, and it was going to happen. Period. In spite of any haters, family, cousins, anybody, people in the neighborhood, friends, anyone, it was going to happen. But at the same time, it's a long road, and it's a very lonely road at times. And fortunately, I have a great family, and, you know, we have two great families. You know, my, my spouse's side of the family is great, too. But, you know, had not for my family, a media family, I would never be here. And a few close friends, I would never be here. So it's really interesting in that the discussion around it and the realities of hockey, there have been improvements. And we are on a better course than, than we were as a sport before. But I, I, got, I got news for you. There's a long road ahead. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of work to be done, especially for people that don't look like us, because that is the power structure. Yeah right? That is the power structure of the game from grassroots. I just talked about all the way to the NHL and at everything in between, that's the power base. So for the people that don't look like us, there's a lot of work to be done to continue to make it more inclusive, to make it a better sport, to cast a wider net for, for people of different colors and backgrounds and religions and genders for sure. And sexual orientation, mm -hmm. no question. But I would also say, and nobody's talking about this, from our standpoint, for people that look like us, it needs to be better too. Yeah. Because there's too many factions. There's, you know, there's some yeah. different agendas with some people. There's some, uh, which of course is not, a, which is of course, yeah. not unlike all yeah. backgrounds, right? There, there, exactly. there, there are factions, yeah. and, but we see totally. like, I mean, totally. my God, we can go in so many directions here, just yeah. of everything that's just been said, but sure. what you were saying, about from 1982 to now, mm -hmm. takes me back to our offline conversation last week where sure. we were old school and actually talking on the phone. Totally, uh, right. And, and you said benefit of the doubt and how it isn't afforded evenly across the oh, board. Totally. Like, what are we doing? Whether you're trying out for a team or you're already in the NHL or you're ascending the ranks as an exec, how can there still be some people that don't get the benefit of the, of the doubt? Like, none of us are perfect. We've all done things we wish we would have done differently. Totally. And I just, I just struggle with that. Mightily. Because you're looking at it from the perspective of someone who gets it. It's about looking at it from the perspective of someone who doesn't want to get it. And so often, I think we hear these phrases of, I can't believe this happened. And so like this morning, I don't know if everybody saw it, but the LA police department is investigating um, a Valentine that um, was found in their department where it was a photo of George Floyd. And I believe the phrase is you take my breath away or something to that extent. And we hear these things and we go, I can't believe people are saying this. No, believe that people are saying this. And like, that's sort of the thing is like, we sort of love to act like we are in the Shangri-La when it's like, no, we have racists, we have sexists, we have people who are homophobic, xenophobic, who dislike different religions. And that's just it. It's like, yes, you can have all these conversations about equality and trying to advance for equality. But you also have to be understanding that there are people who don't want that. And to put it in the most simple, basic, primal way, it's no different than sports. Like, yes, you have the team you root for and you cheer for that you want to see win. Well, there is another team that is rooting against your team that wants to see themselves win and see you fail. And again, that's a very basic sort of way of putting it. But like when we have these discussions, that's exactly how we have to understand it. It's like, well, yes, we might feel a certain way 
in the sense of we want X, Y, and Z to happen. There are people who don't, and that's reality. Yeah. You know, it's funny you talk about benefit of the doubt. You know, the, the one thing that my mom kind of ingrained in me at a very early age is as a black man in America, and in Kevin, I'm assuming it was the same thing in Canada, we sometimes have to be twice as good just to be considered average, uh, just to be considered as good. We don't get to be mediocre. We don't get to be average as as black people, you know, in, in our society. So the benefit of the doubt is, is huge. And, and that's why you have guys like Kevin Weeks and, you know, their, their, their teacher is saying, um, yeah, maybe you should try something else. Maybe that's not going to work for you. Right. Be, because we're not supposed to be here as, as black folks, we're not supposed to be in, in hockey in in other areas we're not supposed to be in these areas so it's trying to to break down those norms but you know when, when you hear people say i just don't understand i i can't believe it there's a certain segment of, of the population multiple groups across a wide range that not only believe it but we live it we see it every day you know that's that's Tuesday for, for us. That's, that's a regular day of the week. I hate to sound cynical and I, I hate that I'm saying that, but I mean it more so rather than being outraged about it, try and do something about it. And I think that we always put the onus on the disenfranchised and marginalized groups to fix it, right? It's always on men or it's, it's always on black folks to try and fix the issues in the black community. We're always asking women, you know, why does this happen to women? We need to ask the larger majority, why do you think this is happening? And until we start having these conversations with the populations that these issues don't happen to, it's going to continue being that cycle. And it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Oh, we'll just let them deal with it. They're worrying about it internally. We can go back to being comfortable and not have to worry about it. And also, like, when you look at this sport, really all sports, the word we always hear is accountability. Yeah. You can't sit here and preach to other people about being accountable when you yourselves are not being accountable. Like, yeah. why do things happen to women? No, stop asking, like Everson, stop asking women this. Ask yourselves this. Like, ask, like, your homeboys this. Like, what are you doing to really make the situation better? Mm -hmm. Like, are you listening? And furthermore, yeah. like, you can't sit here whether, no matter what group you're a part of and say, I want people to listen to what? I go through what we go through, but ignore everybody else. Because look, at the end of the day, everybody's trying to fight and strive for the same thing. But it goes back to that whole idea of accountability. Like, are you being accountable to yourself? Are you being accountable to the grander scheme? But also, are you holding those around you accountable? Totally. I mean, look, every day, even as a 45 year old man that I talk to my parents and specifically my mom will say this more than my dad, be decent, keep your head on, keep your nose clean. You already know you're black. You already know what it is. You have to do this. Why do I have to hear that from my mom at 45? Yeah. We know like, why. <laughs> we know why. Like, on, and then, you know, because you know your contract and you know work and then you know you because the contract and your contract's up. I've heard this like literally since <laughs> I was a kid. And then since I first started signing contracts, I've heard it. And up until now, I hear it. And it's coming from my parents in the best possible way and, and the most loving and protective way. But what parent should have to be saying that to their kids? That kind of answers where we are in our sport to date. Because I've been here for 24 years in the NHL between playing and broadcasting now. And my mom and dad are still saying the same things. So have we gotten better as a sport? Yeah. Have we made some strides? Yeah. But this notion that, well, you know, Willie, it's so amazing that he broke the color barrier, but this notion that, well, we have, you know, we hired him, we have him, and we have a council, and we have this council, and we have these types of things. I don't want to hear that anymore. It's almost disrespectful, to be honest. It's disrespectful. Like, even, this has pretty, been pretty public about some of these other potential opportunities um, around management for me, and executive management, and senior management, and C-suite, and whatever the case may be, team president of hockey ops, GM, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, a lot of times the way it's been characterized, it's an out-of-the-box hire. What's out of the box? Like I wasn't working in Cameroon. I didn't have an auto dealership in Cameroon, and I just moved here. And Duffer, you made the point. 
it's the lens through which people see things in terms of what's comfortable, what's idealistic versus what's real. And I can give you guys, I'm, I'm going to bring a little levity to it. There's a lot of nights if I was on the wrong side of the scoreboard, I wish that five against was a two. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I wish that four spot against was a one or a shutout. But you can't rewrite facts and you can't re rewrite history. But sometimes some of the people that are in positions of influence and power in the power structures uh, have the ability to do that, clearly. And that's what's crazy to me. That's the head scratcher. I don't know whether I forgot this, never mm -hmm. knew it, but when you just pointed out the opportunities that, you know, you may have been pursuing, when I think back and, and statistically look back mm -hmm. to the start of your career, mm -hmm. I did not realize how long it took you to get your first win. To win a game to save my life. And this is important for me to impress upon people because mm -hmm. you just said you've been in the game for 24 years. Mm -hmm. And when you've not, not specifically you, mm -hmm. but in general, when we talk about not getting the benefit of the doubt, and clearly there were some teams that moved on from you as well, mm -hmm. I am beyond impressed with how you stayed true to your love of the game when clearly not everything fell into place easily. Thank you. I, I use this phrase, and it's sometimes it, it'll elicit different emotions. Sometimes you can get to the verge of literally tears. And sometimes it's you're really upset or you're, you're pissed off or you're just disillusioned. But I love the game even when it doesn't love me back. And that's really what it's come down to. You know, there's times where the game just doesn't love you back. And quite frankly, Duffer, there's times where, contrary to what some people will say, it's – well, okay, well, I don't know. He's wearing Air Jordan, so we don't know. Ah, uh, well, he has this car. Uh, I don't really know. Ah, uh, well, I don't know. He's, he's wearing cologne. I don't really know. Ah, uh, well, he's always sharp. I don't really know. Ah, uh, versus, well, we love this kid because he's from Moose Jaw, man. This kid's a hard worker. I mean, we love this guy. This guy's from, <clears throat> pardon me, Esther Hazy, Saskatchewan. They got a lot of character. Look, my dad worked on a plantation, man. Look, he worked at Applewood's Plantation in St. George Barbados and didn't want to move to North America, did not want to come to Canada at all. And my mom pushed. They got married back home Barbados. They moved back to Canada. My mom had already been there. And I grew up with two parents that went to work with no car for the first eight years in Canadian winter. Never made an excuse, never took advantage of anybody, never wanted any handouts never took advantage of the system, just rolled their sleeves up and worked. Started with my mom and dad. And I got in high level hockey and they got in, all in, and same thing. Never asked for anything, never got anything free, never did anything. And you know, we all know how expensive hockey is regardless of what area you play. What's really interesting about that is there's a lot of times along the way where it would have been way easier to play other sports because you just get the door slammed in your face. Yeah. NHL or otherwise. You get the door slammed in your face and the default thing will, I, listen, I remember my first contract, there was a discrepancy of $750,000 from the pick ahead of me to me. From first round pick to me being a set, 750 grand. And the sentiment was, I mean, like we're giving you, I mean, you know, this is a great opportunity. It's a great contract. So that's what kind of started on that course at the NHL level. That's kind of where that started. And that never really got fully righted with the exception of a few places that I played with great people like Paul Maurice and Jim Rutherford in, in Carolina and, and obviously Glenn Sather and the Rangers and Lou Lamarell and the Devils for the most part. But a lot of it in between was pretty spotty that way. And for something that I couldn't control, it's an unwinnable race, not based on your ability to play or any of those things. Obviously I had talent, but just the perception gap and the bias and the perception gap, that's something you can, it's very difficult to overcome. It sounds like, the thing, though, like shut up and play or you should just be happy to be here. We're giving you this money. Oh, so I, I don't understand what you're complaining about. Take the money and go play. Certain experiences are afforded to others that the rest of us just don't get. Cause 
the thing I was trying to avoid saying on this Zoom call, but I'll say it is this, like, you look at the people who are on this channel. One of them has the potential to be the first black general manager in NHL history. The other is the first black team broadcaster in NHL history. And the other is the first black national writer in NHL history, to my knowledge. And yet we're talking about this in 2020, 2021, when it's like, when you look at other sports, the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, like some of those things have already happened by now. And so, yeah, like we want to sit here and act like, okay, we've advanced in this conversation. And in some ways we have, but like when we talk about like the Kevin Weeks of the world, it's just, it's been there his whole career. Like I'll never forget reading all the things I read about you. And one of the things I kept reading was like, he's so athletic. Yeah. He's in the (laughs) NHL. I would like to think he's athletic, but like, is there anything else you can say? And it's just like, when you are a kid reading this, like, it's one of those, is this what I think it is? There's no way. But then when you get older, it's like, yeah, it's no different when you cover high school football in Texas. Like, you would say, hey, coach, tell us about this team. And it's like, oh, like, they're smart. They're like field generals. It's like having a lot of coaches on the field. And it's like, oh, so you're playing a white team. Okay, coach, tell me about this team. They're fast. Like, they got athletes all over the field. It's just like, it's a track meet. Like, oh, you're playing a black team. Thank you. So right. it's always been there. Listen, you know, that's one thing that's really important is, and Duffer, you know, I saw this firsthand in working with you, is the amount of research, the amount of impartiality and objectivity that you have and had when I work with you, and you always have is a big part of your DNA as a person, but also as a broadcaster in that you are one of the smaller population that we have of people that do that. And you don't have any skin in the game. Obviously, you work for the Sabres now, but with us for all those years at NHL Network and even preceding me, you didn't have any skin in the game. It was fact-based. It was research. It was objective. It was detailed. And you present it. And this is what it is. And you do it in a pointed but respectful way. A lot of people don't do that. And these gentlemen were just alluding to that. And Ryan, you were just saying that. And that's why when I started broadcasting, I'll go back to my parents again, my mom, don't ever go out there and say something foolish on TV and that let somebody come back and then say they have a problem. Mm-hmm. Don't do it. Don't be an idiot. And you know what? It's true. My parents always told me somebody's always watching. Even when I was a kid, dad, were any scouts here today? Dad, I didn't see anybody today. Dad, somebody's always watching. And it's the same thing in TV and, and in what we do in multimedia now where I'm cognizant of the fact that there's somebody's parents or grandma or uncle or sibling that might be stationed in Iraq that's watching Armed Forces Network and watching their brother play. So it's, it's doing that and doing our jobs in our current roles with that same respect and fact-based and, and research, impartiality and decency, Duffer, that I've seen from you and, and that you always exude and the same with both of you. But not everybody does that. And hence, that's where the narratives get, get twisted. What we did see in the bubble and last year was we saw a little bit more of the conversation. We saw an emergence of players putting themselves out there. Are we lacking within the game a consistency from the players to stand up and wear more T-shirts, even if it is just February and Black History Month, or wearing something to support those that we saw on display in the bubble like did it come and go too quick is it still there like what where are we at here is there a major lack of continuation consistency when trying to share this message yeah i i i think there is and and i feel you know as as an outsider and i say outsider as someone who obviously have never played in the nhl and i've only been in the nhl for five months you know, you hear a lot of times about how close the locker room is and, you know, nobody is better than than the logo on the sweater. And I think it's what makes hockey such an endearing sport. But then you have things like this where, listen, if if no one's bigger than the room or if the room is so important and someone's having an issue, we all have an issue. And And I think that until you get all the teams and, and everyone on a team buying in, you're going to continue having these questions and these conversations. And, and, you know, Kevin, I I thought it was perfect. Um, You know, you were talking about factions and especially amongst us as black people, we can sometimes have the, well, I'm supposed to be the only black guy at this party kind of vibe. And I think until we all 
actively help each other out like you have done. You know, I was able to talk to Anson Carter for a half an hour, 40 minutes a few, uh, about a month ago. And, and he was amazing to talk to. And he was like, I'm just here to help. Ryan has always been willing to help and, and talk to me and impart his wisdom and things like that. So, you know, until we can all come together, not only as black people, but I think as hockey players, as a locker room, as, as a PA, whatever the case may be, until we're all rowing, the boat on the same side in the same direction, we're going to continue to have these, these issues. We're going to continue to have to have these conversations. Yeah, no question. Let me piggyback that. I feel like it can become very high school. And I've been saying this privately and I'll say it now. It can become very high school and very cafeteria. I'm not sitting with them, but I'm going to sit over there. I'm not going to sit with her because her hair is short and I'm not going to go here. It's embarrassing because the only real strength you have is bandwidth. That's it, especially in team sport. It's not like golf with Tiger where he came and changed the whole game as an individual athlete. It's not like Venus and Serena. Luckily, there's two of them yeah. as sisters, but they play, you know, at least they had the strength of playing doubles and they dominated that and then they dominated as individuals and Serena will be the best ever. That's a different game in their ecosystem. But for us in a, in a, in a team dynamic, as you just talked about, and as a sport, it's very important to realize that for our business, for the interest in our sport, all of the different revenue streams, and for the per, per public perception of our sport, it's really important to continue to grow and expand on who's playing it, who's working in it, regardless as to what background, what color, what gender, what sexual orientation. Because the more our sport matters to more people, the more it matters. And the more it matters, the more profitable it's gonna be. And until that happens, you know, we're a $5 billion league, I think right now, if we were more progressive, we could be a $7 billion league. When you look at, let's say, where hockey falls in the scope of American yeah. viewing habits, like you've got the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, college football, college basketball, and yeah. the Premier League. So the yeah. NHL is realistically playing for seventh place. What do all those other leagues have in common? They're, they're open to a wider group of people, like with soccer. You have totally. Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane playing for Liverpool, and they both are African. You see this in different leagues and in different things. And I think the thing that's really worrisome if you're this league is this. U.S. Census figures predict that by 2050, exactly. more people of color are going to be in the majority in terms of race dynamics in the United States. Like, if you can't find a way to appeal to a broader group, then it becomes an issue. And so, like, when we sit here to about how representation is important, yes, it's important because it's like we want to see more Everett Fitzhughes. We want to see more Kevin Weeks. We want to see more Soroya Tankers and Sarah Nurses. Like these things are, are more than important because, yes, it only lets children know that they can be a part of this, but like there's a place for them. But also at the risk of sounding really crude, if you want your business model to stay alive, it is just that simple. You need to appeal to everyone. It's no different than TV. Why do people watch ABC? Because ABC had Shonda Knight. ABC had Modern Family. It had all these things. Why do people really only watch CBS unless it's sports? Because CBS caters to like the 55 and older demographic, man. Right. I don't know anybody who's 30 and younger who's like, oh, man, let's go watch NCIS, <laughs> whatever it is. So, again, it's about appealing to the broader group. So, based on that, and obviously hockey has often, if not always, been perceived, uh, especially in the U.S., as stronger regionally than nationally. How does hockey get the game to our youth based on everything that you guys are saying, and especially to young people of color? Drive home the fact that you want every girl and boy, every man and woman across all cro the entire cross-section, and certainly starting with us, to play love watch the sport and starting at a grassroots level i am a classic example my dad played cricket growing up my mom wasn't into sports the only reason they got into hockey is because of me period same thing for my little sister period that's the only reason and i am exactly a test case of what they're looking for so you hook the kid then you hook a sibling you hook a parent you hook an uncle two parents grandparents and it almost has a spider web effect but it also has to be something to where it's driven home and the youth programs are such to where it's affordable for kids to play. I'm sorry. Like 
honest to God, I'm hearing some teams back in, back home in Toronto, 15,500 for registration, 15,500. I'm hearing some teams in LA and, and other parts of California, $30,000 for registration. Are we talking about polo or show jumping? Does that come with a horse and a stable? Or like, what are we, are you serious about life right now? Are we trying to get secretariat and you're trying to get the next Mike Smith as a jockey? Or are we trying to develop a hockey player and, and girls and boys to play and enjoy the sport and adult rec too, to enjoy the sport? Like that's where it starts for me. And I can tell you this factually speaking, I was underwriting a hockey program back home and there are other people that were in the league that were my age that never came, that never supported people that looked like me that never came, that never supported people that didn't look like me, clubs, league, zero helmets, zero bags, not a roll of tape. From that program, there's over 11 kids that played in the NHL. And I was underwriting the program myself. Wow. That's awesome. I'm not saying that to grandstand. I'm just telling you the facts. Does that so mean you got Daly, the extra 750 when you signed? <laughs> oh, wow. You know what I'm saying? So from whether it's Trevor, daily two-time cup champ, Devontae smith Pelly winning in Washington and having a big hand on their fourth line, Wayne Simmons, all-star game MVP, P.K. Subban, two-time Norse Trophy winner. I can go up and down. And at the time, a lot of people looked at me like, what's this guy doing? Like, why do you have a hockey school that seems minority focused in Scarborough? Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you buying ice time? Why are you doing whatever? And the fact of the matter is I've seen it firsthand with my own time and resources and dollars. I've seen that it works. So I think that that's really a big part of where it starts, Duffer and, and gentlemen. And then also to make the rinks inclusive. Like, it's not a good day today to go and call somebody's Italian grandmother a racial epithet. It's not a good day to do that at a minor hockey arena. It's not a good day to laugh at somebody's grandfather that's wearing a turban at the arena. It's, not, it's never a good day to do that. So those two things to me, creating that environment, accessibility, creating the environment, and, and that being driven by league and by clubs, I think that'll, that, that'll go a very long way. Because me, as, as rinky-dink me as I am, doing it in Scarborough, I saw that firsthand, the, the impact that it can have. I think accessibility is huge, too. Um, mm -hmm. Growing up in Detroit, Red Wings, you know, I, I got into hockey in the middle of their back-to-back -back cup run. They were, mm -hmm. you know, the team of the 90s. The closest rink outside of Joe Louis Arena was about 20, 30 minutes away from my house. Mm -hmm. um, how many NHL teams play in downtown blank? Urban centers, okay. yeah. Exactly. You're right in the urban areas, um, but your closest rink is out in the burbs. You know, I, I think the NHL, and again, this is as an outsider who's now just on the inside, the NHL, the teams need to put money into the urban areas around their rinks, setting up, um, you know, learn to play, learn to skate programs within the communities that they play in. These players drive by these areas every day on their way to the rink. They should be stopping off at this school, at this rec center on their way to practice in the morning to play ball hockey. Um, that's what we're trying to do here in Seattle. Our practice rink has the first three sheets of ice, uh, one for us and then two that are going to be largely – pretty much all community focused, the first three sheets of ice within Seattle city limits. Um, so trying to give back to your communities is huge. It's one thing to go out to the burbs. And, and I know that's where the money is. And, and I've had a lot of bosses and, and GMs tell me, you know, we are a for-profit business. I get it. You're trying to make money. I understand that. But if you really want this game to grow, if you want this game to look like the cities that you play in, you're going to have to do these things. You're going to have to spend money to ultimately make money. And if the closest rank to these kids is a half an hour away, you're not getting these kids. You're not getting these parents because it's easier for me to go play street ball, to me to go play football, for me to play soccer, whatever the case may be. You want me to play hockey? Then help me. Help me help you, right? Because that's, that's the only way this is going to happen. Well, and here's the other thing. So there's a couple of takeaways from this. The first is it's like we talk about making the game more diverse, not only on the ice, but it's off the ice as well. Like yes. that is such a big component. Like when you have people 
in the boardroom and marketing and all these places who are different than what's normally and who is normally coming through the door. It is going to make what you're doing different. It's going to make people more interested. So I had this conversation with Javier Gutierrez, who is the president yeah. of Arizona Coyotes. And he made the point to me once of how he was like, you know, and people ask, hey, now that there is Hispanic Latino ownership in Arizona, I guess this means you're going to go into Spanish speaking communities. And he's like, well, you could do that in Los Angeles and San Jose and Dallas and South Florida and Tampa and Miami and Boston and Chicago, Detroit. The point is there are Spanish speaking people everywhere. Like I am Hispanic and people go, there's no way. And it's like David Ortiz is darker than me, but yeah, sure. So the thing is Hispanic people, Latinos, we are everywhere. And that's a group that you're missing out on. And then when you look at like, the popularity hockey night in Punjabi has had. Like, you cannot sit here and say that that does not matter. So we talk about the on ice. We have to look at the off ice. We have to look at how do you get more people as team doctors, um, accountants, you name it, board members, because that is ultimately how you're going to grow the game. And then it's also this point, too. I get people definitely want to win. They want to see success on their product. Look, let's not sit here and act like every draft pick you're going to make is going to go to the NHL. So teams have taken losses before when they've invested money. So maybe why not do it with something like diversity and inclusion where you will at least see a return on this as opposed to anything else that you've seen a loss on money with, because let's face it, not every investment's going to work out. But if, the more you can reach people, the better off you're going to be. I love what you said there. Unfortunately, Duffer, we have a lot of default thinking and default doesn't get you anywhere. Where's default getting think where, where's that thinking getting you? Like if I was a default thinker, I don't know, maybe I'd, I'd be growing coconuts in Barbados. I don't know. Have like two mango trees. Like I wouldn't aspire to play in the league and do TV and do these other things and own businesses and whatever else. Like you've got to be progressive. And to me, I look at the Vegas golden Knights as setting the bar in Progressive, I spoke to their owner, and I have a good relationship with Bill Foley, their owner, majority owner. I remember talking to them backstage, finishing NHL awards. They were turning the set over, and it was going to be an NHL expansion draft. Mr. Foley, how's, tell me about your team. We're going to be on our toes, hard to play against, never retreat, never give up. We're going to have the spirit of the night. That's why we're named the Knights. We're going to treat the players first class. Our staff's going to be treated first class. We're ready to go, ready to win the Stanley Cup. Frick! The first year they get to the damn Stanley Cup final. What are we talking about? <laughs> I don't really understand what they're doing. Uh, I don't really understand. They have showgirls at the game. Uh, they have dancers. Uh, there's this, there's that. That's why part of what makes them awesome, because they aren't the Winnipeg Jets, who aren't the Dallas Stars, who aren't the LA Kings, who aren't the Buffalo Sabres. They're uniquely different, but they've gone about their business in a uniquely and different way. That's a customized way for their marketplace, but also that's among best in class. Like other leagues were, were sending their club teams to Vegas during the Stanley Cup final to sniff around and see what best practices they can rip and try and incorporate in their organization. Yeah. Duffer. Like, and, and, and oh, by the way, while the arena has a corporate sponsor, they're yeah. okay with referring to themselves playing out of the fortress as well. Like totally. that, that's a thing for them. So when you're willing to do it and you've got a partner that's willing to, and why wouldn't they be? Because the whole thing's a success story, right? Totally. Yeah. It's, it's a really good point. Guys, the list is never ending as far as things that we could keep talking about. And honestly, it has been so good to hear everything from each of you today, but I do want to give you each last 30 seconds, a minute to yourself, as far as one thing that you would want to, to leave our, our audience with today. You know, just summing up what everyone says, and, and, and I think that representation is so important and people will roll their eyes, but people don't understand the power of seeing someone who looks like you doing something that history says they're not supposed to do. That's why Kamala Harris is such a trailblazer. You know, Kamala Harris, the, the first black South Asian woman to be vice president. History says she's not supposed to be there, right? Barack Obama, the first black president. History says he's not supposed to be there. Black doctors, lawyers, NHL goaltenders. Um, the, the list goes on and on and on and on. Seeing people in positions of power who look like you has such a huge effect 
on people and more more of an effect than I think folks realize. And for me, it's really important for teams to continue to hire, to to bring in, to uh, celebrate their diversity, gender diversity, racial diversity, whatever the case may be, because as cliche as it sounds, if we want to get to a place as a society where these issues are no longer issues, we're going to have to start making these spaces and these arenas, both literally arenas and figuratively, more representative, uh, representative of what our communities and what our towns look like. So I, I think that's that's the big message that I want people, if there's anyone who's in charge of hiring or, or whatever the case may be watching this right now, you do not understand the power of having people who look like you in a place that they're not they're not supposed to be in. And I think that's huge. Awesome stuff. I would say that excellence is an exclusive. Prince never just played the guitar in Minnesota, although he's in Minnesota. Everybody knew about him all around the world. The great Chuck Berry as well. Everybody knew about him all around the world. Beyonce, the Williams sisters in the tennis court, Michael Jordan, the greatest ever. I mean, we can go, the late great Kobe Bryant, Oprah Winfrey, Ray McGuire here in New York. Uh, there's so many different people that from different backgrounds and different vocations that have had excellence. But imagine if the excellence was only in their town. Just imagine that, or the city that they're from. Then it would never have the, the bandwidth and it wouldn't be great as we know it to be today. And I think as you're looking at this from a business perspective and a community perspective, and more importantly, a people perspective, the best of the best have that amplification. It's not in a cocoon, it's not in a silo. They have that amplification. The reason why kids are going around in different parts of London or Sierra Leone or Italy or Greece and they're wearing a Ronaldo jersey is because, not just because he's from Madeira off of Portugal, it's because his greatness is allowed to be felt by everyone around the world. Everybody's able to feel it and, and get a touch. I got a jersey, I got a Ronaldo Nike shirt, I got my Jordan Nike hoodie, the same thing. People are able to feel that it's living and it's breathing. And I think our sport has great underpinnings. It has a lot of great things going for it. But to catapult the greatness that what that is today or yesterday into what greatness looks like tomorrow, we have to continue to ebb and flow. We have to continue growing and elevating. And that comes at the heart of being more inclusive. It comes at the heart of being more cutting edge. And I said this, and even the discussions with these clubs, treating people well first. It's never a good day to be a donkey. It's never, it's, that's, that's not a good day to be a racist or a misogynist or, it's never a good day. I don't care if you're an owner, team president, a business ops, GM, coach, whatever you may be, that's long time ago. That's definitely not contemporary. It's not today and it's not where we're going. And ultimately I think our sport inherently has a lot of great things. But with these adjustments, I think it takes our sport from here to here. When you look at this sport, you have to ask yourself, do you want to be golf or do you want to be tennis? And what I mean by that is we look at golf. Golf had Tiger Woods. And yes, you saw some players of color who came in and out, but it's not the way it once was to the point where people would stop what they were doing. Certainly not watch the majors, but the rest of the events on tour. And from it, we've seen things like golf courses shutter all across. North America. We saw Nike pull out of it. Like it's yep. now at a point where like these stores like an Edwin Watts, which used to be big, aren't big. Whereas if you look at tennis, tennis is at the point where it's more than just the Williams sisters. Yep. It's Corey Goff. It is Sloan Stevens, Madison Keeve, FAA, like Nick Kyrgios. Like you are seeing more of this and not only you're seeing more of it, but it's more popular now than ever before where people will stay up two or three in the morning to watch the Australian open line. And that's just it. It's like any sport, any business that wants to be around long term, you've got to appeal to people. Why is the NBA and the NFL popular? Because it has a wide base to the point where let's leave it here. The most Googled athlete in 2018 was Tristan Thompson. And it was because of the fact that he appealed to people beyond basketball. Now, that's not saying everybody needs their own Tristan Thompson or Mary Kardashian, but understand when you appeal to a broader group of people, 
It's only going to make what you do better. It's only it's the only reason you're going to last longer. Because think about it like this. Behind me, I have a map of Euro European clubs. 20, 25 years ago, my best friend and I would watch European football. We had to pay for pay per view. People thought we were crazy. And now it's like we see kids who are just like, man, I'm disappointed Chelsea didn't win the league. Man, yeah. there was a point in time where Chelsea finished top four with Jimmy Floyd, half of them scoring 20 goals. You did a damn cartwheel. But now it's changed, and it's because you broadened your product. Totally. Amazing. This group was small but incredibly powerful, and we can't thank you enough. Gentlemen, thank you. Thanks thank to you, Duffer. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah.